Um, I will call the York County Council workshop to order. Um, welcome everyone who came out here today. Um, I do want to say a few things. Uh, went back and reviewed the video. I think we're at a new location. We typically do our workshop over on Heckle Boulevard. Um, we moved it here because we anticipated, number one, one wanting to have this um, live streamed, which is where the capability to do that is here. And some folks have reached out and, and thought that this was an opportunity for the public to come and speak, and it's not. So n this is something that may could change in the future with council, but to be consistent, and I just wanted to state at the outset, the purpose of this meeting is uh, for council to get educated on topics, for us to have information presented to us from management, for us to have that opportunity to speak um, and ask questions of management. Um, but I did want to make sure um, I had gotten some conflicting feedback from some folks and wanted to make sure we do want to hear from you. You certainly, if there's something that's that's not, um, that you want council to know, I would encourage you to leave a note with a uh, clerk to council or to send an email to council or reach out to our staff on planning so that uh, the community's concerns can, can be known and reach out to us directly. I'm sure you'll want to stick around or if you want to catch us later or give us a call, um, you can do that as well. With that said, we do have several things that we need to take up tonight. Um, the first being, we'll just go in order, discussion regarding uh, York County Code 154-200, protection of grand trees. David, did y'all have some information to share with? We do have a few slides. I'm going to let Jonathan talk through those. Okay. Yeah, so I understood this was to be sort of a listening um, session for uh, how the Grand Tree Ordinance has impacted some developments or potential developments, but I did want to start off with um, some history of the Grand Tree Ordinance just as a baseline so we all understand what we're talking about. Uh, the Grand Tree Ordinance is not new. I, I had heard um, you know, some of the criticisms of the Grand Tree Ordinance is this is new and it's harmful, but it actually dates back to 2002, and it was adopted as part of the Tree Conservation Ordinance. Uh, so the Grand Tree provisions are a part of that tree conservation. Some recent amendments in February of 2021 um, there were some revisions as part of the overall open space ordinance, and uh, two of those there were to reduce the grand tree size from 32 inches at diameter breast height, which is about four and a half feet high, to 24 inches. So that would have included more trees that qualified as grand. And the scope of a grand tree survey that was required to identify these trees, that was reduced from uh, what used to be the entire site to only the limits of disturbance for a proposed project. Then in March of 22, as part of the RECODE project, um, some provisions of the Grand Tree protections were modified as well in RECODE. So there were some diameter changes to the trees there. So pines were restored back to that 32 inches uh, diameter breast height. And there were some additional trees added that are more regional in nature that would be 12 inches or under, but most trees uh, would be at 24 inches and invasives are excluded. So if you've got a 50 inch tree and it's an invasive species, it is not considered a grand tree. The scope of a grand tree survey was adjusted to 24 feet outside the limits of disturbance and that was to capture grand trees that might be just outside of the limits of disturbance such that their root structure would be damaged by development and likely cause the tree to fail. Um, so those were added there. It added an ability to have staff administratively remove, uh, approve the removal of grand trees that conflicted with, quote, necessary elements that, quote, unreasonably impede objectives of the development. So prior to that language being added in RECODE, um, there were uh, four parameters in which a grand tree could be removed. They were very specific. It was for the uh, installation of utilities, um, public safety, things like that, very limited. Um, so that language added more flexibility for staff to allow grand trees to be removed. It also added the Planning Commission waiver process so that if a developer did not like uh, a staff decision that, that was uh, not in their favor, in terms of grand trees that they wanted to have removed, it gave them an outlet to ask the Planning Commission uh, for permission to remove a grand tree. 
and it also allowed for the replanting of trees that are removed um, through mitigation that 0.75 inches of trees planted for every one inch that is removed. And then uh, just this past July, as part of the batch three revisions to recode, there were uh, two additional options added for mitigation. So previously there was only that replanting option. And in July, uh, you all approved to add uh, an extra tree save uh, and, uh, and or the potential to have a fee in lieu contribution to the York County Tree Fund if there was not sufficient space on a site to mitigate through replanting. And so just as a refresher, there's a list of all the grand trees that have been requested for removal since recode was passed. And that's demonstrating that staff has administratively approved 90% of all grand trees to be removed to this point. Thank you, Jonathan. Are there any questions for staff? Yeah, so the court first question is, so the, you know, when in 2021, when a lot of these changes, some of these changes were implemented and then 2022, um, prior to 2021, have we, did we see an outcry to make changes from the public to, to, to drive to the changes that were made, you know, based on that? So. Because I want to kind of get us do a stare and compare prior to 2021. Yeah. So as I outlined, all the changes mm -hmm. um, since 21, and 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 uh, so <clears throat> I'll characterize it this way. So there's one change um, that made the Grand Tree Ordinance, uh, all those provisions, more difficult for projects mm -hmm. since uh, 21, and that was adjusting the size of, from 32 inches to 24 inches. Mm -hmm. And that was as part of the open space ordinance, which uh, was uh, intended to be part of the overall recode package, but council wanted the open space provisions done ahead of, of the overall adoption of recode. So those provisions were uh, pulled forward and done first ahead of uh, the rest of recode. And uh, in working with our consultants on that, we analyzed where other jurisdictions in the state of South Carolina have their threshold for uh, other jurisdictions call them heritage trees, grand trees, whatever the terminology might be. Uh, and we found we were sort of an outlier at 32 inches. So that was the recommendation to go to 24, um, which is what you all had adopted. Aside from that change, every other change uh, makes going through the grand tree protection process uh, easier. It has watered down the ordinance from what it was prior to 2021. And that's in part based in feedback that we heard from developers. Um, it's in part uh, based on feedback that we heard from uh, some cases that went through the Planning Commission and Zoning Board about uh, arguing about different types of species and how we measure things. So all of that was feedback collectively mm -hmm. uh, over the last several years that went into that uh, RECO project as we worked with the consultants on, on creating any of the changes there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right, I have a couple of questions. So I made notes as I, people sent me emails, people called me, so I'll just try to go through these quickly. So there was, a, there was some concern over removing vegetation. They're saying that harms the trees that are left, but are you saying on this page, scope survey adjusted to 24 feet outside disturbance, that refers to that, is that correct? Yeah, that would address that, that type of concern. Um, if the concern is, well, uh, we don't want to protect grand trees that are close to where a project is because some of the disturbance is going to uh, compromise that tree. That's exactly what that uh, added scope of the survey was intended to address so that staff can see, well, we've got uh, a grand tree that's 15 feet out of the limits of disturbance. We want you to uh, ask for approval for that to be removed as well because it might be a safety hazard. Uh, if it's that close to the, the limits, you might compromise the root structure and it might fail over time. So do you feel like 24 feet is enough? Would you, or do you think they're asking for something 30 feet, 36 feet? Well, the, the 24 uh, foot number, and uh, it's based on uh, an approximate, every species is a little bit different, but you have to put one number into your code. Uh, so it's based on the approximate ratio of 
uh, tree's diameter <coughs> to its uh, root diameter. So if you've got a 24 inch diameter trunk, you're likely to have a 20 foot, uh, 24 foot diameter uh, root structure. So that's why that uh, separation distance is established there. So you're capturing most trees that might be reasonably compromised by development when you have it uh, set at that distance. And I'm guessing other counties have similar foot requirements? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right, thank you. Next, uh, large oaks and public places around buildings. There's some sense of concern that maybe the large oaks close enough to buildings could fall, limbs fall on cars, things of that nature. Is that a concern? Uh, I've seen that comment. Uh, I do not share that concern. I mean, trees certainly, over time, they do have failures and they drop. However, uh, if you didn't have uh, grand oak trees, I mean, much of what draws people to the low country is um, those live oaks with the Spanish moss hanging through, and they are all over. They, you know, they're in the public right of way. They're um, adjacent to historic structures. So, over time, the property owners should, uh, you know, keep an eye on the trees that are on their private property, or um, if it's on public property, the government should keep track of where the health of those trees are. So, if a, a risk does pop up over time, that it's adequately addressed. But there's not an inherent risk to having large trees. Okay, let's talk about the sketch plan process. Do you feel like at that stage of the process, is there any way that, that we could have already had conversation with the developer or whoever wants to do something on the property prior to the sketch plan process that may cause them to not even want to proceed or, or we could agree that certain mitigation or certain trees could be left or have to be removed is there a step that could take place before the, before that process, the sketch plan process, that would make sense? The shorter answer is no, and 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 not even at the sketch plan process. So there might be a misconception about what the sketch plan is. It's simply a sketch. Uh, it's it doesn't need to be done by an engineer. It can be done by hand. Um, you're just kind of depicting what you are proposing to develop on your property because you are interested in getting some high level feedback from staff about what you haven't considered with your project. You know, is my use allowed? Do I have the right zoning district? Am I going to have to go through a special exception process to get my use? Um, have I thought about setbacks? Have I thought about easements? Have I thought about property access? Very high level questions like that. So it's a very cursory review. Um, and as a quick turnaround on those from a staff perspective, they are not meant to be exhaustive reviews. And when we complete our review, the review letter with the listed comments, uh, they are just informative. They are not binding. They don't ha grant any approval to move forward with any development. And no one is required to submit a sketch plan uh, at any point in their process. It's just some, a tool um, for developers or uh, even property owners, uh, single family homeowners, if they want to, to take advantage of getting some preliminary feedback. Do you feel like there might be a better way to handle mitigation and the allowance of grand trees at the sketch plan process or just right after it to gain some efficiency for the person that's looking to develop the land? So um, with preliminary plats, um, at which apply to residential development, with commercial development, you're going to go straight into your civil construction plans, uh, barring some need to get your property rezoned. Um, so that's the first point at which you might get an approval. So a uh, preliminary plat requires you to have a grand tree survey. So it doesn't require you to mitigate trees at the preliminary plat stage because you're just having your preliminary design, you're going to the planning commission, this is what we want to do, we fall within the parameters of the code, this is what it's generally going to look like, it doesn't need to look exactly like this, but pretty close when we come to our civil design. Uh, so the purpose of having the grand tree survey at that point is so the developers know where the grand trees are, staff knows where the grand trees are, and the planning commission knows where the grand trees are. So to the extent that there might be clusters of grand trees shown on that survey, the developer ought to be thinking at that point, well, is it worth my time to try to force those trees to be removed, or should I maybe alter my preferred design to have them retained? That's a choice that they make in their design process. If they really need to have a particular site developed, then yeah, they should obviously move forward with requesting those to be mitigated. Uh, 
Now, when you're on the civil side <clears throat> doing a commercial development, and this applies to everything that isn't residential, there is no process prior to your civil construction drawing. So you submit those, once they get approved, you're good to go uh, and start clearing land and um, doing all of that. Uh, so that's the only point at which we can grant an approval to mitigate anything, whether it's grand trees, whether it's uh, asking for a variance or a waiver of any kind from the Board of Zoning Appeals or the Planning Commission. That's the only space and time we have to approve anything. Uh, there isn't any process before that. So I think what uh, some of that, that question might be uh, alluding to is the discussion we had during uh, second and third reading of uh, these batch revisions, latest batch revisions, in which some folks in the community were asking for, well, uh, we don't want to have to consider whether or not staff or planning commission might approve or might not approve the grand trees that we want to be mitigated. We would like to, by right, be able to remove the trees uh, and then mitigate by the outline process. And if you recall, we did have the, the two different um, ordinances that would have put into effect what the ask was versus what the staff recommendation was, and uh, council opted to go with what the staff recommendation was, which is the existing text as it was and as it is now. Okay, I'll hurry through the rest of these. Um, do you feel like credit should be, should be given for a tree save above the required minimums? Uh, yes, and that's uh, something that council added to the code. So uh, with the revisions this July, so there are the two additional options for uh, mitigation. So we already had tree plantings, and so the extra tree save uh, was one of the options that was added for additional mitigation. So if you're required to have 20% tree save, and you need to remove some uh, grand trees from your property, and you'd like to, you have the space available on your site to go up to 30% tree save, you can do that. How about credits to be given for saving trees or vegetation around creeks, streams, wetlands, buffers, anything to assist with runoff or you know, ground protection? Yep, I've seen uh, some um, code provisions do that. Um, where you have a scoring system based on where the tree is located on the property. However, I think that gets very complex very quickly, um, and it gets uh, very math intensive about where a tree is. Is it, you know, where do we establish it? Does it have to be 50 feet from a stream? Does it have to be 20 feet for a stream? You have to get very precise about where those trees are located. Uh, and specific to streams and riparian areas, developers can't use that area to develop anyway. So they are uh, leaving it undisturbed regardless. Um, so I think the ask there is to get extra credit for, for property that they aren't going to be developing on, uh, period, in that instance. Okay, last question, and I appreciate the answer. I, I wrote down a couple questions on that that I'll address after this meeting. Um, is there any value in treating maybe industrial property, schools, any differently in the process before they purchase land? so that they know what they're up against with buffers, tree buffers, and uh, what they're going to need to do on the property as it relates to the trees? What do you mean by treat them differently before they purchase the property? So allow them a process to vet what their expense is going to be and what the, uh, the clearing, the grading is going to be required or, or what they're going to be required to do to save trees. Yeah, what you're describing sounds like uh, any developer's due diligence process, and if staff needs to be included in due diligence conversations, we're always happy to, to hold meetings and uh, consider a, a sketch plan if, if that's appropriate. Okay. Do we commonly do that? We do. Okay. Great. Thank you. All right. Thank you for answering my questions. Anybody John? else? <clears throat> yeah. Mr. Atkins. Jonathan, on, on this chart here, you got lot lolly and which... I run the sawmill, I'd call it smooth bark pine, um, American holly, dogwood, blackjack, etc. Who who determined this? Because the loblolly pine and the smooth bark pine are by no means any shortage and ain't the best thing in the world to have in your yard. And you talk about the oak trees in the lower part of the state, that's a totally different variety of oak, pin oak, 
most of our oak trees here that would make grand trees are red oak. And they soft centered, they don't even really make good firewood and usually at age, as it gets on them, they hollow out. You only have lives on the outside about six to eight inches. And limbs break out of them. I got a bunch of them on my farm right now. And I was just wondering who determined this list of trees? Yeah, so a couple things there. So uh, the list of trees, uh, originally, our consultant brought us a list from Hilton Head that had far more species to it, uh, and we felt it was more appropriate to scale the list down to trees that are uh, more regional to York County in nature, because um, it, 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 it made more sense to do that, do it that way. Um, so our uh, landscape architect, and we have another member of staff who is a certified arborist, uh, they worked with the consultant to cultivate this list. And the loblolly pine, um, it's funny you mention that because there was a, a, a Board of Zoning Appeals case that got pretty contentious and the value of the loblolly pine was discussed at length. And at that time, uh, a loblolly lo uh, pine was uh, a grand tree at 24 inches. So that case and some of the discussion about the value of the species regionally is the reason why it was increased up to 32 inches. Uh, and as for the, the hardwoods, um, Primarily what we see in terms of oaks, at least uh, what I have seen on submitted plans is water oaks and white oaks is the vast majority of the oak species. Um, so I, I can't say as to how hardy those species are. Yeah, I just well, know that those the are the primary. water oaks would be considered red oak. Uh, and they get soft in the middle. But I don't know anybody that would want to say pine trees in their yard though. That'd be just about as bad as sweet then. And just to clarify, none of this applies to individual property owners' yards for their personal residences. This is only for new development projects. Right, but yeah. either, I mean, either, you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Jonathan, when, when that was changed over from 32 down to 24, was there any at the time, and again, these changes, sometimes you, you have these ramifications that come after. Did we have any idea of what the, the density change would be on a property that, I mean, so a normal property would probably have 25, 24 inch trees as opposed to 10, 32 inch trees. Was there any density evaluation done on an average of what, what would be impacting our properties when we made this change? No, so that would have required us to do um, tree surveys of, of multiple properties mm -hmm. because uh, tree surveys that were submitted prior to this would have only listed 32 inch uh, diameter trees. Okay. So uh, very clearly you would have more trees, but right. there was no knowledge about how uh, many more uh, grand trees there were right. you know, going from 32 to 24. Uh, just that the 32 inches put us as an outlier in the state for uh, jurisdictions that were protecting grand trees, um, and 24 was more of an appropriate middle ground. There were some jurisdictions that went far as far down as eight inches. Um, so 24 uh, felt like a fair middle ground if we were going to adjust it at all. Yeah, I just, you know, again, sometimes you, activities that occur and Changes we make, we don't see the da we don't see the ramifications of this till downstream. Uh, you know, I think it to me. My, I mean, I, I know we're not talking about recommendations, but I would recommend going back to a 32 inch myself. So, thank you, John. I have a couple of questions, just, um, and I'm glad you clarified that because some folks at home don't realize they think um, that that this ordinance applies to them and their personal homes and want to once again clarify it does not if you want to go out and cut your trees in your yard you're allowed to do that without any request from the county this really only applies to commercial and I think when this came up it was it was designed or at least I remember a lot of the discussion from council being how do you prevent this clear cutting and track development from coming in there that really was what what was an issue is just seeing it just completely get leveled and um, trying to address that but I, I guess I, I to piggyback on some of the other questions, do you see, um, I guess for industrial park, 
it's, I don't, I'm not sure how this applies to maybe the data center, but industrial par owned land, which was industrial before the changes were made, typically that property is treated a little differently as well as property that is owned by the schools um, that own that property before any of the changes were made. Do you see a need to, to treat them differently? Uh, I don't because the, the goal is to uh, retain uh, existing tree canopy throughout the county uh, when we are developing property and to have the ecological value and the aesthetic value that a grand tree offers that um, a newly planted tree or a removed tree doesn't offer. Uh, so I think the impact, whether you are doing a 150 home subdivision, whether you're building a school, whether you're building a warehouse, whether you're building a new fire station, the impact to the tree canopy is all the same. Do you, do you have any frame of reference as to how much these grand tree surveys are costing before you even explore what the next step is? Uh, I have not had any, any numbers quoted to me about the cost. Okay. What are, since implementation, are there um, major concerns that you're hearing from the community? And if, they, if so, what are they? I think there um, is, is probably a good amount of trepidation in the development community about um, getting approval for grand trees to be removed, but uh, I think that's uh, a largely unfounded fear to the extent um, uh, that we've reviewed applications thus far. We've approved the vast majority of grand trees to be removed, and we have uh, added options for mitigation. Uh, the new options were just added in July, so we've not had any projects take advantage of that yet, but I know they are coming. Um, so I think where we are at with revisions to uh, the Grand Tree Protections is in a good spot. Where we are um, protecting Grand Trees, there is a vested interest in the county in uh, being green and having a healthy canopy and having large, vibrant trees be visible to the community. I think we're doing a good job in addressing that and having sufficient outlets for developers to uh, identify where their grand trees are going to be uh, ahead of their development process so they can try to design around them. And if they can't design around them, we also have sufficient outlets for them to mitigate. I think if the latest amendments that were made, I, I had a little bit of concern it is the request that I had heard most um, frequently was is there no way for us to get some sense of, of what we're facing before we spend thousands of dollars on a grand tree ordinance and, and then don't know whether or not we're going to be allowed to mitigate prior to that? And I assume that staff has no, um, no um, recommendation or no, no even proposal to consider on that front. No, we had offered uh, that alternative language in third reading. Um, and really there's no way to make a determination about if removing grand trees is appropriate if we don't know where, the, where they are uh, and what the plan for development is. If a uh, project developer comes in and they have a large big box warehouse development and they say we would like to know if we can get approved for all the grand trees we might need to um, have removed. There's no way for us to know where those grand trees are. Are they on the perimeter? Are they where the box needs to be? Um, so there's no way to offer that assurance without knowing where the grand trees are and if the project can be designed around them or if it can't, um, then we can, we can certainly uh, approve those to be removed. And I think the language that was added in uh, 2022, the necessary elements that unreasonably impede, I think our objective there is to always approve the removal of the grand trees if uh, otherwise the project would not be able to move forward. So we never want to say, no, you need to retain that grand tree, and the developer says, well, we can't, we can't uh, remove that, and um, we've exhausted our PC waiver process, the Planning Commission agrees, we're not going to be able to mitigate, so we, we can't do this project, we're going to have to walk away from it. We never want to be in that position. We always want projects to be able to move forward, so we're just asking can you design around it? And if you can't, okay, you can have, remove the trees, but just mitigate them. Those are my questions. Any others? Any other comment from council before we move on to the other items on the agenda? So, uh, you know, I, I, I think overall, you know, when, when we look at changes as were made, you know, 
we made a change here in 2021 to bring it to 24 inches. But the concern I have is that when you make those changes, you don't really understand the ramifications and to understand the percentage that increases the number of likelihood you've got more grand trees on your property, obviously it's going to exponentially go up on there. Um, the difference between a tree making it from 24 to 32 inches, you know, and width, obviously there's storms and stuff that probably some trees never make it to that point. I think this to me is a, is a, is a example of when we as government need to kind of back away from us enforcing something that we have really not the upfront knowledge of the impact that's going to cause on that developer itself. Um, to me, I would recommend to the council that we move it back to 32 inches. I think, I think because it will, it brings it back to a point when I don't think we were f seeing these ramifications. And I think it brings it to a point where I think it's more of a logical opportunity for everybody to keep grand trees, but to make it rational and not be an overburden for companies coming in. So I would recommend we look at bringing it back to 32 inches. Mr. Huxby. Uh, any reaction from David or Jonathan? Well, I'll just say it. I'm, I'm going to have to rely on Jonathan on this as well. But it, it was, if I remember correctly, Jonathan, it was 32 inches across the board. So every tree was 32 inches. And if, it, if you had a 28-inch significant tree that was of a different species, uh, we might all agree that that's certainly a grand tree. So we made those appropriate for species. And do you have that slide to show what's allowed for what species? Uh, I don't have that as a slide, but the um, council members should have that in the uh, information in front of them. Yeah, so just to restate that, uh, a grand tree, I don't think, just saying they're all 32 inches is appropriate because some trees become grand based on their species well before they reach 32 inches. So we did try to go back to the, the pine trees, a 32 inch, you have a 34 inch pine tree, that's a pretty big pine tree. So we did eliminate the pines and some other species between 24 and 32. So they're, they're, they're back at 32, but some trees re attain a grand tree status far before they reach 32 inches. And we can look at that and maybe look at that chart and make some determinations whether we've set those appropriately or not but I don't know that a just blanketly going back to a 32 inch across the board would be the in the county's best interest. But Jonathan, if you want to add to that, yeah, I've, you know, I, we've uh, changed the number um, effectively twice now in the last um, two years. So it went from 32 across the board to 24 across the board to what we have now is more species specific that runs from 32 um, for pines, 24 for most hardwoods and then 12 for holly, nine for dogwood, eight for some of the blackjacks and things like that. Uh, so I think uh, we have done a lot of work to try to find the appropriate number. Uh, uh, I think, you know, because we just did recode last year, we spent quite a bit of time on the tree provision specifically because we were having so many issues um, with it that I, I think we, we did vet it pretty well. And I, th I think what we have in the ordinance, um, nothing has materially changed in the last uh, year and a half that would um, s compel me to say that it needs to be modified further. Um, but uh, nothing is perfect and everything is always subject to, to further refinement. So from a compelling, from to be compelled, right? Um, I think that, you know, when you set an ordinance, um, it kind of establishes what developers are needing or looking at when they come into this area. Um, sometimes we don't feel the ramifications because some developers just say that's just too much and we're going to walk away from it, right? Um, so to say we haven't, we're not hearing a lot, 
doesn't mean it's not necessarily driving away good companies that could would be coming here. Um, so we're not always going to hear that vocal component. Um, you know, I think when we had it at 32, I think that at least, you know, our, our area was, uh, I think, well um, covered with beautiful trees. Um, I think that each developer, when they come in, I think they're going to be conscious of it to a certain point. But again, I, I think that, an, to me, with us making this change, I think it was a change that took it too far. Um, and again, I feel at 32 inch, I think to me is an established grand tree. If we brought it back to that, I think it would, it would be um, a value, I think, to everybody across the board. So. I just want to be sure that I understand what you're asking council to do, and that is to, to allow all trees a nine inch dogwood or, a, or some of the other species that would would never get over 12 inches that, that we're not going to protect those trees we're not going to protect those trees at all so I mean Fort, Fort Mill Fort Mill doesn't have a lot of trees left but there are parts of the county that do and, and Jonathan I think has made this pretty clear that I mean 90 percent of what's been asked to be mitigated has been mitigated and there's not I, I mean people aren't coming to York County and going oh well we're gonna have to save trees we're gonna go somewhere else that's there's not an instance of that anywhere so I mean, either either we are for saving trees and doing that in a reasonable reasonable way. I mean, we're not, we're not trying to stop anybody from developing. We're not we're not we're not saying, hey, you can develop, or we're going to weigh development on one side and saving grand trees on the other. This is a balance, and and the balance is what makes York County. I mean, that's what makes people where it makes this the place people want to come. I mean, I think I think trees are are important, and I think saving them is 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 very um, important. I mean, look at look at what Charlotte's doing. They're, they're, I hate to think that Charlotte, you know, and Mecklenburg County are ahead of York County when it comes to saving trees, and 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 that's where we would be. I think what we've done makes a lot of sense. And there's, I mean, I'd love to hear an example of of somebody that has not gotten what they needed to have to be able to to have have a business here. And I just I just, I mean, maybe Fort Mill doesn't care about trees, but my gosh, I think you know they're just. Probably could have saved a lot of them along the way that have been have been cleared. Well, uh, Fort Mill does care about trees. First of all, yeah, they I do. So. Um, but I think there's also ramifications from changes, and I think that bringing it back to 32, it's I don't think the difference of having that change back to 32 is that much of a drastic change, but I think it's enough of a change to make us um, better, better suited as we look at um, you know, a, a county as a whole to be business friendly. What do you think is the difference between the 32 and the 24? Changing it back to 32 well, does Well, when work. you ask a question, when I ask a question about the ratio, you know, we couldn't answer it, right? I, and again, I'm not, I'm not um, coming out against Jonathan. I, I, I get it's hard to get those studies, but there's there's got to be a pretty big ratio between 32 and 24, right, for the density. So, you know, that's a that's a big impact on a developer. Uh, but, who's, but who's been impacted? There's no example of anybody that's been impacted. Well, we've gotten com we've gotten concerns. I, I I just don't think they're justified. I think that's what Jonathan's well, trying to say. There's no real life concern. It's just the fear is what he said was it was the, the you know, they were the fear, the fear of it. But there's nothing in reality that has stopped anybody from, from being able to, to, you know, come in to come and build here and develop here. Well, well, I do know this. A white oak in 17 years, it can be 24 inches. I saw 36 inch trees on my sawmill. So 24, 32, there's, they are not that big a tree. Uh, but I think that I believe in greenery and having spaces of greenery and leaving more than one tree because the dumbest thing to do is ever leave one tree by itself. 
because you ain't creating nothing but a lightning rod. Um, Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My takeaway from this conversation is I, I'm nine months into serving on council, and I have a lot to learn. I know that our job is to set policy for York County, and so we're doing our best to do that. But sometimes we're at a bit of a disadvantage because we don't sit where you do, Jonathan. We don't hear your staff talk about the concerns or the complaints of the landowner or the developer the landowner has hired or or even the developer who's bought the property to develop. We don't hear the things that they're complaining about. So my takeaway from this conversation tonight is that, number one, I hope that we're a county that is a solution-oriented county when it comes to planning and zoning, that when, if it's the Grand Tree Ordinance or whatever it might be, that we're listening to the individual that has an issue and logically, we're trying to figure out a way to get a means to an end that's beneficial for them and us without overstepping the language on our ordinance. And then number two, what I can't wrap my, my head around or my arms on right now, but hopefully at some point I can, whether it's during this term or my next term, is that what is the cost to the landowner to go through the steps in the process? I mean, I've been through the steps in the process in the city limits of Rock Hill where I've renovated buildings and, and it, it can get costly. And sometimes you can't help but to feel, wow, is this entity working with me or against me? I mean, I'm 30% of this project, 50% of this project, and now I've got something else I've got to do. I hope that as a county, we're looking at ourselves more as a partner with the people that are trying to develop properly in our county. Um, and helping them come up with solutions. So in time, I guess we'll learn more about that. I'll learn more about that as a council member. But I just hope that's the mindset. And if that's the mindset, again, we're at a bit of a disadvantage. That would mean that we would have to know, have an open line of communication with you on the Grand Tree Ordinance. We pass this in good conscience. But then we hear the things that citizens are concerned about or landowners are concerned about that are trying to develop their property. You would need to share that with us, make us aware of it right so if we needed to go back and revisit something we can because there would be basis in doing it right so Thank you. we can we we are 45 minutes in i think we've asked all the questions at least that we have for staff and council can continue to have you know their thoughts and, and discussions but in order to move this meeting along let's go ahead and move on to our second item um we have discussion regarding york county code 155.198 use separation do we have some, David, are we going to? Yes. Um, so as I understood the referral to the workshop, the intent is to um, get some um, understanding of how the provision came to be. Um, so that's what I've pulled together here um, is <coughs> we had a um, Lake Wiley small area plan that was done in, I believe, 2020. Uh, and some of the public input that we, re we received in that small area plan. I should say that when that small area plan was adopted, that became a component of the overall county's comprehensive plan, and that was carried forward through our uh, comp plan update here recently. So that, that plan remains in effect today. So some of the uh, key takeaways from the public input, I pulled the responsive uh, line here. Residents think there are too many storage facilities, car washes, and fast food restaurants. So when we went into the community and got their direct input, a lot of the conversation, a lot of um, the notes that people left on our uh, feedback charts uh, dealt with this issue that um, Lake Wiley, by a lot of members of the community, is seen as a drive-through um, on the way to Charlotte. So uh, the community feels like there are too many of these auto-oriented uses that, uh, but for their prevalence, there might be other options there for, for them to in, uh, take advantage of as a community. So some of the resulting policy recommendations in the small area plan is to uh, promote a diversity of land uses to maximize community amenities. Again, that's directly responsive to that feedback that we received. And two of the points here, um, research the concentration of existing auto-oriented and self, 
store its land uses within the Lake Wiley community. I think that's pretty self-evident. And the last bullet there is to consider requiring special exceptions or supplemental regulations. And what we have now is supplemental regulation to discourage particular land uses within the Lake Wiley community based upon market data and public input. So uh, the intent of the code provisions, which I'll get to in a second, is specifically to discourage those particular land uses because the community feels like they're too concentrated and that concentration will continue and it will crowd out other market opportunities. So it's not meant to prohibit them. It's uh, not uh, meant to overly restrict them. It's just to discourage them. So here is the purpose statement in that um, code section that you all have in front of you. Um, so the auto-oriented uses regulated in the section can have a detrimental impact on the nearby properties due to their potential to operate 24 hours a day, produce noise, generate car, uh, traffic, encourage queuing of automobiles. So uh, that last item number five, uh, the purposes of this section are to prevent the concentration of auto, uh, uh, automobile oriented uses in the Lake Wiley overlay and to promote the, promote the development of pedestrian oriented mixed use commercial areas. So there's a multi-purpose goal there, but the primary one is to prevent the concentration. So how do you prevent the concentration? You have uh, use separation. So that's what we have today, the separation between uses um, and districts here. So here's the list of uses that are established in the code. Um, and this was a use that was established um, by our consultants who did recode with us as they were directed to implement our comp plan and our small area plans. So this is where that language comes from. Um, and some might be curious where the number 660 comes from. That is one eighth of a mile. It's not a scientific measure. There are other uses that are separated uh, for other um, separation requirements that use the same 660 number. So it is one eighth of a mile. That's all I have on that. Questions for staff? Mr. Roddy? Mm. So if I have a restaurant, I can't have another restaurant close to it, or I can't have a, a gas station close to it, or a car wash. So uh, for D, it's restaurants or other prepared food establishments specifically with a drive through or a drive-in facility. So if you've got a restaurant, you don't have a drive through um, this section does not apply to you. Um, and some folks ask, what's a drive-in? It's a little bit nuanced. There aren't a whole lot of examples out there, but um, Little Caesars Pizza is an example of a drive-in where you go in to get your pizza. You're not going to sit down in, in that location. You got to uh, drive up, park, get out of your car, get your food, and get back in your car. Um, so that's an example of a drive-in. Um, so in, in, in that terminology, a regular restaurant uh, would not be applicable. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is, I think it's, is it Taco Bell and KFC, some of those type restaurants that are together? Is that permissible? That I mean, I think they're run by the same. Right. So if you've got a joint location, then yes. Yeah. So if it's one building, sometimes Taco Bell, KFC, you see those. But if yeah. they're separate buildings, then no, they they would not be able to to co-locate like that. But a gas station and a restaurant could be within the 660. A gas station and a restaurant. A gas station and a restaurant with a drive-through could not. A gas station with a drive through restaurant cannot locate within 660. Correct. Wow. Basically, all of these, any of these listed, can't there can't be, explain that to me, 660. Yes, so if you can't have a if you are looking to, I'll pull example for, from this list, if you are looking to establish a new gasoline sales uh, on a site within the overlay, uh, you would have to do a radius analysis, say where are um, any other of these uses on this list. If any of these other uses on this list, whether it's uh, you know the automobile repair, 
if it's a car wash, if it's a drive-through restaurant, if it's self-storage, if any of those are within 660 feet of the site that you're currently looking at, uh, you would not be able to locate a gas gasoline sales use at that location. All right, a couple quick questions. Um, do any of the other six districts have any language similar to the 660 separation rule? So I need to state that the Lake Wiley overlay is not a political district. It's a uh, land use area. It does not comprise all of uh, District 2, um, but it, is, it falls entirely within District 2. Uh, so it's not a political district, and we don't have zoning by political district. Otherwise, we would probably have seven different zoning codes, okay. um, and my job would get seven times more difficult. Right. Uh, but we do have uh, many uses uh, throughout the code that have use separations applied to them. I mean, we're currently talking about tattoo, uh, mining operations, things like that um, have uh, separation distances. And there are other, uh, won't call them areas, but uh, provisions that are derived directly from a small area plan. So for example, uh, the warehousing establishments that reach a certain size threshold, if they're within two miles of I-77 south of the Catawba River, they have to apply for a special exception. That does not, that provision doesn't apply anywhere else in the county other than within um, a, a distance of I-77. Okay, thank you. Would staff recommend the 660 use separation to the rest of the un unincorporated York County? So this recommendation from the small area plan, um, it, and I want to be clear, it's not just a staff recommendation. It's based on community input. It's based on planning commission input and ultimately county council adoption. So it's, I don't want it to be misconstrued as singularly uh, a staff recommendation. Uh, so it, it, it stems directly from that small area plan language. So therefore, the applicability in having this use separation should be limited to the area in which we receive that direct feedback. Now, if we did our comprehensive plan update, which we recently did earlier this year, and we go to our meetings in different areas of the county, which we did, and we received some similar feedback, there's too much of this use, there's too much of this use, there's too much of this use, and it was a universal experience across the county, then yes, it should be applied countywide, <coughs> but that, that is not what we uh, heard. Okay, one last question. In today's climate, when you're looking at commercial development, do you think it makes sense to have to limit curb cuts when you're developing an area, limit curb cuts, require deceleration lanes so that you get the traffic off the main road and get it onto the decel and then into wherever you're going? Um, do you all believe that secondary roads make sense? And then last, what about clustering like businesses? from the reading that I've done, I'm seeing some of this in a lot of the reading that I've done over the last two weeks. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, so the answer to the, the first uh, set of questions there was absolutely yes. Uh, we support reducing curb cuts, um, certainly secondary roads, uh, access roads, all of those things are, are excellent uh, planning principles. And uh, a lot of what the Lake Wiley Small Area Plan talks about is um, one of the other specific recommendations is closing um, existing unused uh, curb cuts because there are properties that have been uh, developed for quite some time that might have three or four or they might have one large rolling one that it's all gravel. It's not really clear where you can turn in and where you can turn out. There's certainly a lot of those. Uh, now, when it comes to uh, the trade-off between having more uh, efficient locations of uses and clustering like uses together. Absolutely, there, there's synergy ha had there. Um, there's, there's definitely access efficiencies and transportation movement efficiencies in having like uses uh, grouped together. That's absolutely true. Now, there's a trade-off um, that uh, council makes as a policy decision. How do you value the level of those synergies with uh, co-locating like uses and trading off the direct feedback from the Lake Wiley community, which is, which is that there is a concentration of a specific suite of uses that is uh, overwhelming their area to the degree that they feel like they don't have other options uh, in terms of retail and things like that. And they might have to drive over to Steel Creek for better shopping options, things like that. 
so that's a, a trade-off. Uh, certainly both things can be true, and council has to decide, you know, which do we value more, and to what, de uh, to what degree do we value one or the other more vis a, a separation distance. Roddy. Just to double back, uh, you pointed at, you, did you mention um, cement plants or concrete facilities about the separation that we put in for those? Did you? Just uh, I think that? I mentioned mining, but because I remember when we similar. did something with whether it was mining or I think it was mining and concrete facilities, that's a total different type of separation because we didn't say that a mining couldn't be close to all of these things. It was more of a, a setback requirement. But this, you know, it's just looking at the different type businesses that were sing I don't want I guess I said singled out that you couldn't be within another restaurant or gas station, car wash, detail shop, uh, boat or marine AT this was very specific. And it seems, you know, you say you want to discourage, but these this seems very prohibitive in nature not to allow these type businesses. I mean, it, this is a, I don't know. I don't like it. I don't like it the way this is written, but this is not my district. Obviously, um, the representative from this district had a lot of say in kind of what her constituents wanted. So if if she's fine with it, as long as it doesn't land us in any kind of legal litigation, I think it's kind of it's written written for that district. But I wouldn't. I'll go on record. Say I wouldn't want this to be in District Four. I wouldn't want this type language in District 4. But as we've discussed previously, all districts are unique into what it can tolerate and what it will support, what it wants to see and what it don't want. So if this is the wish of the constituency in, in Lake Wiley, which I see some people shaking their head, you know, that's with your representative. But I'll say I wouldn't, I wouldn't take this language and put it in District 4 anywhere because it's, it's very restrictive, but if you got 12 um, car washes, 12 storage facilities, and a lot of one thing that you don't want more of, does this really make that big a difference in those coming to the area? I think it, I think it does. <clears throat> Jonathan, how, how much though are we impacting the people's, <coughs> are you impacting the people's individual rights, their land, they own it, I mean? Uh, so the use separation is part of the zoning code and the zoning code uh, throughout establishes your, the parameters for which you can develop your property so it's not infringing, uh, this particular provision is not infringing uh, property development potential than any other provision. Certainly the impact to uh, a property owner who might be seeking to do these specific uses is much higher than other provisions are. But if they are seeking to do something that is not on this list, it doesn't apply. So um, it's uh, uh, a, a <coughs> it's doing its intended purpose. Um, that's stated in the goals of the policy is to discourage these uses from happening. Now, council has the objective say of whether that is a worthy purpose and a worthy goal or not. If um, the goal is to not discourage, then you would uh, obviously seek to uh, remove or amend this in some way, but <clears throat> as it was adopted, uh, that's council's current position with it. Um, so you mentioned uh, tattoo parlors. I know that the restriction was to be uh, X number of feet from a residential, but I don't remember saying we couldn't have three tattoo parlors right next to each other. Uh, and in fact, it does say that. Yeah. So um, it has a, 
uh, footage distance requirement from uh, any tattoo establishment to locate next to any other <laughs> tattoo establishment. So there's the same, uh, and there's a two-part one, so there's also the residential component that you mentioned. So every use separation requirement that's added to the code has an, ob an objective behind it. And based on what the different objective of that separation might be, uh, that determines what you're separating it from. So in the instance of concrete or mining, you're trying to separate those very loud, very obnoxious outdoor uses away from residential property. Because if you're in your backyard uh, sipping a lemonade, you don't want to hear the concrete being crushed in your backyard, right? So that's why the objective there and the separation distance is from that use to a residential property. The objective with the Lake Wiley overlay, overlay use separation is different. The objective there is to discourage these uses, not to prohibit them, but to discourage them so that there are fewer of them being built that are new over time. So that's why the separation is linked to each other and not to residential uh, in any way. Okay. So the reason I brought up the, the, the tattoo component is I think that that's something we're revisiting currently. And I think that, you know, what we put on that, I think you learn from what we do sometimes and we see it, it to me, it was over restrictive. So I think that's something that we are addressing and we're moving forward. When I look at this, you know, I, again, I would not request or support something like this in my district. When I look at property rights and I look at when a, when a property owner has a piece of property and they look at um, what would be uh, good to have in that on this property. There's studies done by that property owner and to decide, you know, what's going to be what's going to bring back the best value, um, and whether it's you know two restaurants or or, or a restaurant or, or a park, whatever it may be. There's a value in that 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 property owner has to look at it from an economic perspective of what's going to be best for them and what really is is great good and they see as a value to the area. Um, you know, I personally think this is government overreach right here. I think there's, there's this here is government overreach. I, you know, again, I wouldn't support it for my district. I do have a concern about this and the fact that, um, you know, this is something, again, that we've got property owners out there that are challenged by this type of government overreach. That would be my opinion. To me, I mean, it seems like it, had this been in place, and I guess this was this was adopted with Recode. Um, when was that done, Jonathan? Uh, it was adopted in February of last year. Became effective March first of last year. So two of twenty-two. Um, had this been adopted before all of the the development had been there, then this could have prevented some of that. And if that's not something that makes sense, it seems like. Maybe it should be applied countywide. The concern that I keep getting is, and that I'm hearing from folks that reach out to me is, is it accomplishing what the folks wanted it to accomplish? Which is, I mean, if it's just not to have any of them, that's one thing. But if it is, okay, we want we want to make sure that the gas station is next to a car wash, that this prevents that from happening, and that doesn't it? Yes. And so some folks have come and, and expressed that concern. Is there, do you have a response to that? Yeah, I, I think um, <clears throat> the uh, language is certainly achieving the objective it, it is set out to try to achieve, is to discourage um, <clears throat> these uses from uh, becoming overly prevalent in the overlay. <clears throat> and we've seen that with projects that have come through for review and we've had to provide sketch plan comments. Have you seen the distance requirement? Uh, things of that nature. So I know there are some projects that, but for this language, probably would have been developed with one of these uh, suite of uses here. <clears throat> so it's definitely uh, achieving that objective. Is it too effective is, is perhaps the question. Is it crowding out too much of those uses? Um, is the distance uh, a, a good number? 
is um, are there tweaks that could be done to accommodate having them perhaps be adjacent but otherwise have to achieve that separation if they are not adjacent? So are there, there are always ways to improve a code, um, to improve language, to suit, uh, suit uh, a stated purpose. Um, so there's always room to change it. Um, but until we have clear direction on what uh, the collective policy goals of council are for this uh, language, uh, we're not sure which direction any potential changes uh, should or could go. Well, I guess is there a way, and I'm just, you may not have an answer to this, but is there a way to prevent two car washes from being within a thousand feet to put the car wash in the place that the community supports the best? to put it next to the gas station instead of right next to the neighborhood? Is there a way to craft an exemption that gets us to a better solution on that? Um, and is there a way to build in, it's one thing to say we don't want more of this, but what, what did the community want? What more stuff did they want? And some ways that we've dealt with this and other, other overlays is to incentivize it, is to say, look, you know, you can, you can do a bunch of warehouse and distribution, but we're not gonna give you the tax break. But how do we give more tax breaks for, for the stuff that the community does want in that area because it is, is the pedestrian oriented development coming? How do, you, how do you incentivize that in a way? Is that part, is that, is that built into this at all to help us? So incentivizing um, particular land development outcomes is very difficult. It's much easier to restrict, so that's uh, why that's here. Um, so it, it's much easier to say um, this shouldn't go here rather than uh, we, the, we the government would like this specific type of use to go here and no other. Um, then you might craft um, a much more narrow district that has a very short list of uses on it um, and apply it in an overlay for a very small area. And that's how you dictate what some of those outcomes can be. Um, that's much more of a municipal approach. So a lot of cities and towns will take that with their downtown as they have a, a carte blanche of a very itemized list of uses that you can go from this list and no other. And that's how they achieve their uh, objectives and what their um, particular air segments of their town or their, their downtown, uh, more residential areas, what those look like over time. Um, in terms of what other tweaks could be done, I mean, you could certainly um, have it instead of be being separated from each and every other use on this list, they could be separated only from the like use on the list. So car wash to car wash, gasoline sales, gasoline sales. Like I mentioned earlier, you could also <clears throat> have it say something to the effect of, well, it uh, needs to be separated by 660 feet from this list of uses unless it is directly adjacent. So you might get uh, pockets of those efficient clusters of the like uses, but they are, those clusters are spread out from each other. There are different ways to skin the cat, as they say. <laughs> Going out to get a bite to eat. One kid wants this restaurant, another one wants this one. Typically, they may be relatively close, but now this prevents that from happening. Now they got to drive this direction to satisfy the kids, and that's not uncommon. That you know, families want to eat at different restaurants. Um, I don't think nobody gets too picky on which uh, gas station they patronize from. QT to Shell to Chevron, whatever, but you know, things can get kind of dicey when you're trying to please the kid or spouse getting something to eat. But I would, I don't see the detriment of having restaurants within a reasonable distance. And but to say they have to go 660, that's a, you said a quarter mile, eighth, eighth of a mile, yeah, it's not that far, but if they were right beside each other, I don't know what. That's going to make or break a community or not. But if any if any tweaks were to happen, like I said, I'd rather see a cluster of restaurants than all the curb cuts and they spread all the way out. But that's just me. I'll adjust that just real quick because I think if we were 10 years prior to tonight talking about this, we would be talking about a crossroads that didn't have a lot built out on it. Um, but here tonight, we already have these uses in place. And the reason 
that the public brought this up is because of where we are today, not where we were 10 years ago. We, we're not looking ahead saying, hey, let's plan this out. We are, we are reacting to what's already been built. So we do have all those restaurants, and they are side by side. And there's nothing further than in, in, the, in the little crossroads that we're talking about where these uses are, there is nothing that's further than 2.2 miles. Granted, it might take you an hour to get there in the traffic because of the density that's been allowed over the years, but, but we're, we're, talking about a we're talking about one intersection and the the, just the crossroads of that intersection. And currently, we have three proposed car washes and, an, and another storage unit facility. So the issue is that we already are inundated with these particular uses. I didn't come up with this list. The community came up with the list. And the community showed up at the public meetings, and, and we've been talking about this. You know, when I first got on council, everywhere I'd go, the questions were, when are you going to get that pothole in front of Fast Frog Bakery filled? And we filled it over and over and over, and finally, we got it done, and it's taken care of. We had a name for that one. A lot of them had names. Now, when I'm out and about, people want to know, my God, how many more oil change places do we need? If you look at the Lake Wiley traffic page, everything's become a joke about the oil change places and the car washes. And, and when something new's coming, everybody goes, oh, it's going to be an oil change place with a storage unit connected to it and a drive through car wash. I mean, it's just, well, I don't guess you ever walk through a car wash. But, you know, this is what the people in the, the area of the Lake Wiley overlay have asked for. And this, this, what we have is in response to that. So to, to try and look at this and say, well, you know, I mean, we're limiting them going forward? Yes, we are. 10 years ago, if we had sat down and said, hey, let's not, we don't want too many car washes and we don't want too many storage units, let's think about this. We, we might have been smart enough not to have them all lined up right now. But when you talk about a cluster and, and you know, you got a car wash and a gas station, who's to say that the next property isn't going to be the person that comes and says, hey, we need to put an oil change place here because we, we, we are, you know, you got a car wash, you got a, and then, and then you want to, you want to, you know, stop and pick up a burger on the way home too. So, so the, there are very few parcels left. I showed y'all in executive session the maps of what, where these properties are, where these uses could be. This is what will fill in if, if we withdraw this at this point. Um, you know what, 10 years from now, when some of these other properties are filled in, and, and maybe we realize that nobody else is coming to Lake Wiley. We're not going to get the restaurants that the people want. We're not going to get the little shops that the people want. We're not going to get any office space. Maybe we'll allow some more of this. But for right now, this is what the people want. This is what a small area plan. Councilwoman Cox and I, we went to the South Carolina Association of Counties. We saw a great presentation on small area plans in other counties. And we came back and we said, hey, we think we, we should do this. And every council person was given an opportunity to do their small area plan. And so it's, it was, it's all based on, on public input. And there's one, there's one that, you know, and, and we're the only two that did it. There's, there's a small area plan in, in her district just as well. And you know what, and some of us might question the, the, the how, how great is that? Does that even make sense? But you know what? If the people there think it makes sense and the council person thinks it makes sense, then it makes sense. And, and that, that's what's important. That's what's important about this. And there's been a lot of talk tonight about development and businesses coming and everything, but there's been far too little talk about residents and the people of York County. And, and I'm going to stand by that for as long as I'm in this seat. And, and there's far too talk about the people of York County and what they want. Any other comments or questions for staff before we move on? I, I will just say I do think that um, trying to find ways to incentivize the positive is probably an approach. That's the distinction between um, the small area plan for the warehouse and distribution. It doesn't it doesn't prohibit anything. It didn't rezone anything. It it said we're gonna um, we're not gonna incentivize. Uh, or encourage more of those things, which I think could be an added component to this. I think you could even explore maybe expanding these these feet per each <coughs> use to prevent that. And then maybe you know some of the folks that have come out and expressed some concern. Um, I don't think they want to have more of these uses. They they just wanted to find a way to put them in a, a better suited place. Um, if 
if there's no willingness to consider that, then I think we move on. Um, but I, I do think that this council is very receptive to listening to the people in the community, and I, I, I know that I know that we do that, and um, I think their council's proven that. Um, the can, last thing. Can I, can I make one parting comment on this? Is that okay. You know, as you look at as you look at York County, you look at District Two, you look all around the county on the areas that are one day going to develop. I think we can all agree that we would like to avoid what happened on Cherry Road and Rock Hill, what happened on Highway 49, the stretch that you refer to. We want to avoid that. So that means that we've got to lean on staff to help us come up with maybe ways, maybe to massage this to get the same outcome, but to um, allow the uses that may be needed in the area. And the reason I say this is that if you discourage these uses and you discourage the developer from coming in to bring these uses in, as rooftops hit in that area, then those people are going to have to drive from that area up to 49, which are already complaining is too busy as it is, to go to a restaurant and to get their oil changed and to get their car washed and things of that nature. And that's why when people come in from the last two weeks that, that when this came up, when a gentleman from District 2 brought this up and I asked us to come to the workshop, I've been reading a lot and I've been asking a lot of questions, but when you when you look at what I mentioned a minute ago, and my notes are off, but when you look at limiting curb cuts and uh, you look at clustering businesses like businesses and you look at putting a grocery store in and, and maybe having a restaurant in the grocery, outside of the grocery store, a Chick-fil-A, let's just say, or Starbucks, those things can't happen. If you can have a fueling station and you know, it makes sense to have a car wash near the fueling station. I just think we have to take these things into consideration, but we can always look at the past and see what did happen, and that can allow us to look forward to what could potentially happen. So I don't know what could happen with these use separations, if anything, but, um, you know, I, I wouldn't want these in District 6 either, um, but I respect I respect the citizens if, in fact, the entire citizens of Lake Wiley have spoken. If the entirety has spoken, then I can respect that. But, but I am hearing from others that feel like this use is not in their best interest in Lake Wiley. So I try to apply it over all of York County to think what makes sense. So I don't know how we massage this, if we massage it at all, but it sounds like there should be some consideration to a little bit of massaging. I will, I will say this too, I think to the folks who live in that area who don't want any more of these things, I definitely think we need to be looking uh, long term to figure out how nobody wants to be called, what do they, what do they call it, the drive through to another, what do you refer to it, Jonathan? Drive through community. Drive through, nobody wants to be that. None of our community wants to be that. I think had, you know, I think maybe separating the uses is something that I think we ought to consider to prevent exactly what Mr. Huckabee has said. The, the Cherry Road problem or that problem. I don't. I don't. I don't want that in my district either. I'm just wondering: is there? Is there? Um, I think, at least for purposes of some of the major thoroughfares where I am, um, maybe separating the use by use would accomplish that. I would love to get some feedback from you, Jonathan, on some of the other areas throughout the county as to what you would recommend to have prevented that from happening. Um, is do you understand my question? How, what is it that you would have recommended um, for, yes, for, that's what I would, I would like to have some feedback. I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot tonight, but I would like to know that for other areas, including for areas Albright that, and any other thoroughfares that. For areas that look like a drive through Mount Holly Road, yeah, yes. Okay. I think that's, those are the things that I, is this what you would recommend or would it be something a little different? Yeah, and that's why I was saying when you look at when you look at Jerry, Catawba, you look at areas of Clover and Lake Wiley, you look at around York, Highway Five heading out to eighty five, sections of Rock Hill that are gonna be developed out. How can we avoid what's happened on and I hate to use these examples, but I already said it a minute ago, Cherry Road and Highway forty nine is two examples. How do we avoid that? How do we develop in an area out in a way that makes sense but doesn't necessarily restrict the uses too badly for that particular area. 
What was so bad about Cherry Road? Did I miss the boat on Cherry Road or something? Yeah, seen all those title loans. <laughs> oh, oh. Now you, you got to go back Every and think corner. back to what those businesses were before they became title loans. Because I was just making a note here. Yeah, Pizza Hut, Pizza Inn, Little Caesars. Uh, I'm talking about going back some years. Burger then, King. And Godfather's. Then you look at grocery stores. We had Harris Teeter, Wendix, Community Cash, uh, Car Lots. We had Ford. Ford dealership. We had Burr and Chevrolet. We had some side lots. So there was a lot of a, a lot of a mixture all up and down. But now when things moved off Cherry Road and went to Manchester, you saw those title loan places move into some of those gas stations, some of those banks, some of those old smaller places. But I was proud of Cherry Road because you couldn't go to Chester and find a Cherry Road. You couldn't go to Lancaster and find a Cherry Road. And you sure, certainly couldn't go to Fort Mill and find a Cherry Road. So Cherry Road did Rock Hill some wonders. And it would have still been good if we didn't go out to Dave Lyle. Because when they put Manchester, it just killed Cherry Road. So I got some good fun memories. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that Lake Lyle does not want to compete with that one. <laughs> but, but you can't forget, though, it's, it's capitalism. It, it, it served it's capitalism. Though. I mean, I used to like to pull up there and there'd be four gas stations at one intersection and watch the numbers, who's got the lowest. I mean, you you can't take people's right of That's competition true. away, true. and their ownership. If this man buys it, and he's that's what troubles me about it. So, so I think that this, this discussion, though, I, I, to me, this was not a discussion about what additional restrictions in, in we could put on our districts. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think this is more of a discussion about the existing, um, you know, ordinance here. Here and I think there was some suggestions that maybe helped to massage this existing one, and I think even you, Jonathan, had mentioned some possible opportunities. So I, I would like to explore that and have further discussions. You know, and not now, but I think there's something more that we could probably come out from uh, our discussions before. That's what I was expecting out of this. So I definitely think having a gas station next to a. a Oh, well. Car wash makes more sense than putting it somewhere else or having, you know, I mean, I, I do think that it's a little bit counterintuitive, but we will move on. We have a third item discussion regarding York County Code 154.477 penalties, defined terms, penalties, and defined terms. This is all related to the proposal that was made um, by staff. Yes, this was uh, an item that had um, <clears throat> public hearing and second reading at the last meeting. The second reading was deferred um, until we could discuss it in more detail at this workshop. So um, just to reiterate some of the reasons that staff is proposing um, this text change is our code enforcement activity is up, our owner compliance in uh, complying with those enforcement actions is down. Resolving cases it remains an ongoing challenge. It's always been that case in every jurisdiction across the country. Code enforcement is a very uh, difficult profession. It's a difficult uh, area um, of responsibility. So we've seen an increase in our um, days to close a case. So it's taken 23 additional days um, this year to close a case versus the same period uh, year over year and a 56% increase in cases going to court. Um, year over year and so a case doesn't go to court unless a property owner uh, just doesn't comply you know they'll see receive a notice of violation um, they'll receive time extensions they'll uh, talk to the code enforcement uh, officer over an extended period and they just are not responsive or refuse to comply and that's when our only option at that point is to give them a summons um, and go to court so what the proposed amendment is is to define a property violation so that would uh, expand the existing withhold applications enforcement tool um, to apply to more types of violations. So I wanted to emphasize, and I feel like maybe this was uh, missed in our last discussion, is this is a really limited applicability. So we're really only talking about situations in which um, the property owner has uh, an ongoing uh, code enforcement violation and they refuse to address it. 
So uh, that has to be true, and they are seeking an unrelated approval from the county. So those two things uh, have to be happening on the property simultaneously, and that's very limited. We're talking four or five instances of that per year. Uh, so here's uh, the text that would define a property violation. So it would be any violation of public nuisances, uh, uh, building violation, flood damage, uh, stormwater, uh, land development code, and the zoning code. And so if we simultaneously had a uh, code enforcement case that we weren't getting any responsive action from the property owner and they were seeking some sort of uh, alternative approval unrelated to their violation, um, that we would have the ability to uh, not process that application until they cleared that violation. So uh, the example I provided last time, same one here is uh, letting uh, property owner lets their grass and their weeds grow on their property. It's well over two feet high. They refuse to do anything about it after extended conversations and many months with a code enforcement officer. But then simultaneously, while refusing to address that violation on their property, they're seeking uh, permission from the county to have an accessory dwelling built on their property. So in that instance, we would say, well, we'll consider your uh, accessory dwelling permit as soon as you cut your, so cut your grass and clear that violation. So that's what really what we're talking about. If it's a different property, um, but the same owner, you're saying, um, it's not uh, written into the code uh, that way, but that's certainly something that could be changed uh, for second reading or third reading if that was a desire of counsel. Um, I'll give another example. Uh, came up at uh, Planning Commission last night. Um, there has been an ongoing code enforcement case for a year and a half now on uh, a property in which the property owner has an accessory um, storage structure that he built on the property that was meant to serve his adjacent um, property for his home, but he's been operating a business out of it, um, storing um, things outside on the property. Uh, it's become a mess. Um, neighbors have been constantly complaining about the appearance of the property, and it constitutes a nuisance violation. Um, and he's uh, sought a rezoning application, so that um, process is underway now with Planning Commission. He also had some zoning violations on the property, uh, including having a shipping container on the property being used as storage, um, since been removed. Um, so that allows, uh, by our current ordinance, that allows the rezoning to move forward. However, he's made no effort to clean up the property. So it's still, um, it's got trash, debris everywhere. Um, junk parts, all that stored out in the open for the neighborhood to see. Um, so the Planning Commission debated uh, whether or not they should recommend to Council a condition of approval um, that those violations be cleared prior to uh, rezoning being granted, things like that. That was part of the conversation. There's even a, a, a motion to deny because the uh, violation had been ongoing for so long. Uh, without action from the property owner. Um, ultimately, they uh, met and discussed uh, at length in executive session. They came out and made a recommendation for approval of that, but that's just some of the conversations that have uh, been unfolding on some of these really long, outstanding uh, cases. We have a lot of them, um, and there are uh, a few instances where if a property owner is seeking permission from the county to do something else that's unrelated, that we have an opportunity to withhold that other approval until such time that they clear their long-standing violation. So that's what we're asking for here. Any questions for staff? Mr. Audet. Um, yeah, the one question I have is, what is the time frame for which, um, and I didn't see it, maybe I missed it, but they got a violation, but are we giving them 30 days, 60 days, 90 days before we would actually withhold um, uh, movement on another request? Uh, there is not a specific timeline in there other than uh, the only specific timeline in the code is every property owner gets a notice um, and they have 15 days to correct and take some form of action. So that's in the code. Uh, everything else after that point is uh, unique to each case, right? So sometimes it's a matter of um, cutting your lawn. So 
you know, we grant extensions for those all the time. Uh, it might be appropriate to grant a 15-day extension. It might be appropriate to grant a 30-day extension. A property owner might say, I'm going on vacation, but I'll address it as soon as I get back, or I'm disabled and I need to hire some help to help me do it. Right. We have those conversations, and they're all unique. Mm -hmm. uh, and you might have a different type of violation that's much more intensive to um, correct. So if you've got a someone who builds an entire building and they didn't get any uh, approval to do that and they are operating a use out of it that they're not allowed to have, well, uh, the resulting correction might be to remove the building. Um, so obviously that's going to take a lot more time than 15 days. So each and every case is unique mm -hmm. and we are very generous with our timelines with mm -hmm. um, property owners to come into compliance. Uh, so uh, the the goal is always looking for proactivity. So if a property owner is responding, they're answering phone calls, when a uh, code enforcement officer shows up to reinspect a property to check on their status, uh, they have a conversation with the officer, the officer notices that this area looks better than the last time I was here, we're good, keep making progress, I'll give you another extension. Those are the types of conversations that we have in every code enforcement case. It's when we uh, stop uh, receiving uh, any sort of communication, uh, uh, a property owner goes dark, won't answer the door, mm -hmm. uh, won't answer the phone, uh, and refuses to address it, um, and it goes beyond the point at which we've already granted extensions. Um, so to answer your question, that's a long-winded version, but each and every case is unique, uh, but we always approach a code enforcement situation trying to be generous with uh, additional time. Um, so any withholding of permits or any other escalation, whether we're sending them a summons, anything like that uh, is always the point at which a property owner stops cooperating. Yeah. So, no, thank you for that. So the reason I'm asking is that, um, to me, I'd like to see a little bit more structure in the expectations of their response and when, how they need to respond um, in some framework. Because, again, a lot of times there are n some people don't know they're in violation. I mean, I know some people think, well, okay, maybe I am, maybe I'm not. There's violations that occur. Some landowners probably had no idea they were ever in a violation um, because they, when it was put in, there was no restrictions on whatever it was. Um, but I think that I think the language of, of moving to that next step, I think we need to just kind of spell it out more that there needs to be interaction within 30 days or 40 days, whatever it is, but give them some, some structure of, of, a, of a timeline which they're going to be impacted the maximum amount, which means that they would be held back from any other permits. I would just like to give the, the homeowner the benefit of, or whoever it is, the benefit of the doubt to make sure we're as clear as possible when we're going to stop moving on their other request. So that would be my ask with that. Um, so when we um, have our letters that go out and our code enforcement officers are in constant communication with, mm -hmm. with all the property owners that are under violation, um, they communicate time frames and their expectations and they also set up um, in our Evolve system when they are due to reinspect. So um, they keep extensive notes. Um, so all of that is, um, is tracked. So uh, if the ask is to have additional timelines put into the code um, that specifically spells out at, uh, how many days um, at which you might get escalated to step X, Y, Z. And this is just one of many different uh, enforcement mm -hmm. options. There's stop work orders, there's cease and desist orders, things like that that are mm -hmm. in the enforcement toolkit. So if, if the intent is to provide specific timelines to those in the code, that takes away all flexibility that we have to work with the, with the property owner on extending timelines and like I said, each and every situation is different. Um, so flexibility is very, very important uh, when it comes to trying to um, have cases get resolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and I understand the flexibility component. I just want to make sure that they know what's coming. Okay. Yeah, if the concern is that uh, you know. if you know we set a deadline and they, they don't address it, and then the next day we say, okay, your permit's revoked, we wouldn't do that. We never do that. Uh, so we give people uh, advance notice um, and, and many deadline extensions. So it should never come as a surprise to somebody when they've hit the next step in, in enforcement escalation. Yeah, the advance notice of 
you know, within 30 days of no change, this will happen, or something along those lines. Right. Because this is new. So yeah, I'm and we would saying, do, we I mean, would do those. Be up front. Yeah, yes, yes, sir. And we would do those in the form of uh, updated notice of violation letters mm -hmm. um, and, or letters from the zoning administrator, uh, whichever is more appropriate to the situation. Um, and that would spell out in, in clear terms if you do not do this by such and such date. Um, you know, and, and our initial notice of violations, it covers everything. It says if you do not take action in 15 days, these are the suite of things that you know, the county has to encourage you to clear your violation. Uh, so those letters are, um, are, are what we rely on to communicate that. Um, and mm -hmm. having it be in the letter versus in the code uh, retains that flexibility. Because once you take it out of the letter, and it's no longer specific to that, and now it's in the code, mm -hmm. everyone has to apply uh, by the same timeline, no matter what, yeah. uh, which makes it very difficult if there are um, vast differences between the level of effort involved to clear a violation, depending on what type it is. So if it's in the letter, then it, that, that works for me. I just want to make sure that we're very upfront. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Mr. Huckabee. Over the last nine months, y'all have responded quickly when I have sent you information on a complaint, and I appreciate that. I have a request, though. The person that's filing the complaint against a neighbor that's running a business in the neighborhood and it shouldn't be there, can you all take on a little responsibility to let the person who filed the complaint know what's going on because they're contacting us, and then i got to contact you again, and I'm in the middle. I'd rather not be in the middle, personally. But is there a way to keep them abreast of what's going on um, that would be a, a, a shift in policy. Um, so happy to consider that if that's a, a council objective. Um, and I'll say that 98, 99% of all code enforcement cases that we get is somebody tattling on their neighbor, neighbor right? You know, so that's why I always be friendly with your neighbors. Um, well, I'm just another reason for that. <clears throat> so uh, to the extent that somebody making a complaint is expecting an update from staff on where their complaint is, uh, a lot of these things up, end up in litigation. Um, so we receive the complaint, we take action on the complaint, a code enforcement officer might follow up with a complainant to receive more information before they investigate a certain site. Uh, what is it that I'm looking for? Do you have any photos? Uh, do you have any documents um, that show what your covenants are? Things of that nature. Um, but it, it would be a significant departure from our current policy uh, if we were to start updating all complainants on the status, if a violation was issued, um, where the violation is at any given time, um, and that's going to open up more confrontation between complainants and our code enforcement officers. And, and frankly, they have uh, enough <laughs> confrontation when it comes to the property owners that are under violation, right, because they're uh, the ones that we're compelling action from. But if we go out there and a code enforcement officer inspects the site and they determine there's no violation here, um, and they have that conversation with the complainant, now it's an argument of, well, I saw this and this is how I read the ordinance. So uh, there's a lot more effort and a more time and uh, more <laughs> difficult conversations that we are asking of our code, code enforcement officers if that's a direction that council would like us to go. Are y'all in the same situation where you're having to call about code enforcement? Somebody's complaining in the neighborhood? Because if you are, maybe it would just be a reply back to us because then we could just reach back out to the individual and say, here's a quick update. Maybe that's what we could consider. Because I could see it could be time consuming for you to respond to everybody that's filed a complaint. But they are reaching back out to us if we initiated the introduction to the complaint the concerns that i'm getting have more to do with folks who've been doing something for 20 30 years and code enforcement like t taking a little bit different interpretation of of what was allowed and i would like to see more um, of the letters actually be more transparent because i get more calls from people who are like oh my gosh i got this letter i've been trying to get a hold of somebody it, it you can't do anything in 15 days and, and then that they but the way the letter reads is i'm going to be I'm going to be um, charged $500 a day every single day until something happens, and they don't know that what you really mean is reach out and start a dialogue, and then they don't know after that what what can I be comfortable with so that I really want to try to work towards a solution, but 
I need a, several people at the table to make that happen in 15 days doesn't allow that to happen. I certainly don't, I, I think somebody who's re, a repeat offender who, who comes out and does stuff on lots of different properties throughout the county, I think we need to address that. My bigger concern is that I'm seeing more of the opposite of that and I'm seeing how do we, how do we maybe have that, I'm having to have too many conversations to explain that and maybe tr find ways to troubleshoot and find solutions. Um, and and would like to see the letters, I'm having to answer more of those questions. Well, what does that mean? And, and that doesn't mean this. And Yeah, I, I agree. I've had several of those. Yeah. So. Well, a um, couple things on that. Um, first off, if a property owner has been uh, doing something for 20 or 30 years, if they haven't been doing it according to the code of ordinances and somebody complains about it, we're obligated to enforce that. Uh, it's not a matter of uh, a, a new interpretation. Uh, the code says what the code says. So we always treat every case. Um, we consult the code. It's not our goal to go out and, and enforce cases and find uh, problems to create for ourselves and property owners of York County. We, <laughs> we have a lot on our plates, and we're certainly not seeking to add to it. Uh, but when we receive a complaint, um, most often it's legitimate. Sometimes it's not. Um, but if it's a legitimate complaint, if the language of our code prohibits a certain activity or use of the property, we're obligated to take action on that, regardless of how long it's been there. Uh, on the letters, um, certainly we're always uh, open to improving anything that we write. Um, I understand that if a property owner receives a notice of violation um, and it, it describes um, that you've got 15 days and there's a time frame and you know I might get a court summons or I might get a, a fine, all that seems scary. Um, and uh, so that all can be tweaked. Now, I will say that the vast majority of folks who receive a notice of violation, that's not the first time they've heard about their violation. They've already had a, a conversation with a code enforcement officer on their property, and the code enforcement officer has explained why their property is under, uh, potentially going under violation, what they are observing on the property, and they're already having a pre-conversation about how to uh, correct it. And then the conversation will end, well, uh, by the way, you're going to receive a notice of violation in the mail. It's going to describe in detail what your violation is and how to correct it. So it's not just a verbal component. It's not just a written component. It's both. So sometimes you might not have a property owner present, and that's when that, that letter is the first thing they see. But the vast majority of the time, um, they've already had a conversation with a code enforcement officer. And our officers, whenever they go to the site and they don't have a property owner present, and they, uh, they will leave their card. They leave it at the door. They will often leave notes, please call me. Um, so they're encouraging the property to call them before they even receive a letter uh, notifying them that they're under violation. Um, so the, to the degree that uh, property owners that are under violation are, are coming to council members, um, they might not understand what their violation is. They might not understand that their neighbors or someone else has observed something going on. And they might not have even taken that step of calling either the number on the card or the number that's listed on the, the letter. They might not have. Um, so if they have had those conversations and they're reaching out to you and there's, there's a problem in communication there, I definitely near, need to hear about each and every one of those so I can encourage you all to continue to contact me about those. But uh, it's really important for property owners when they have uh, a phone number that's directly linked to the person that's responsible for observing their property, making a determination on if there is a violation or not, and then is responsible for following up and making sure they take corrective action, they really have to have conversation with that responsible person. Um, so, you know, we're trying to be partners, just as, uh, you know, Mr. Huckabee, as you mentioned, that your county is a partner in uh, projects uh, being developed and under development, and we definitely serve that role there. We're also partners in properties, uh, for property owners that are under violation. We are their partner to help them bring it into compliance. Uh, we have the same attitude in both instances. Um, so we're not trying to be punitive, we're not trying to um, cause problems, we're just trying to enforce the code as it's written, uh, and we're obligated to do so when uh, a county resident informs us that they they have observed a violation. Thank you, Jonathan. I didn't mean to put you on defense by saying that. I do think that, that it's very complex and we've changed recode and a lot of the things that we're seeing, or at least in my district, I can only speak to mine, are, are UV things and 
So folks wouldn't have gotten a notice that the UD uses had changed. They just wouldn't have known it. And then someone complains, and then it's considered nonconforming. Seeing several of those things, I, I, I very much appreciate the dialogue that you give. I think maybe putting, figuring, and, and I do think that y'all work well to reach out and to have those meetings. It's just very complex, especially for folks to understand where are we maybe having something in there to, to set up a meeting where they can sit down and ask all of these hard questions because um, it, it's most of the time what I'm seeing are things that had changed three years where they wouldn't have gotten a notice that something changed because RECO had maybe changed something there. Um, but I do think working towards problem solving, how do we fix this that satisfies you know, to the neighbor if we can, but also that gives this some very straightforward, very direct help on how to how to solve that. And I appreciate the work that y'all do there. We do have, we do. Is there any other comment? We do have a, an executive session that may take us a little bit of time. I'm just going to answer Watts's um, question. So it's it's similar but different. You know, I get a lot of complaints from um, um, people that are reporting things that I have to report to the sheriff, and they always want to know what happened with that. And um, so. A lot, it's, it's hard sometimes that you have to tell them, you know, we're not going to communicate back with you. Like when, sometimes I report things to the sheriff or somebody, and I kind of want to know what happened too, but at some point you just have to kind of let that go and let the sheriff do their job. Same with, with planning, um, um, and I do public works is very different how I handle that, so I'm happy to tell you that too. It works easily if you have a lot of leaks in your area. But um, So when somebody calls and, and complains about something, generally I will pass that along to um, – to Jonathan directly to Jonathan and uh, via email like if because because if they complain to me I ask them to put it in an email and then I pass that along to Jonathan and copy both of them and tell tell um, the person sometimes I don't don't copy both of them I send it to Jonathan um, and um, generally just tell that person to um, let me know if, when it's resolved and that might be you know it could take a while it could take weeks it could take months but just to let me know when that's resolved and if it hasn't been resolved and what seems like a reasonable time just to follow up with me and then I'll follow up with Jonathan and usually usually things are resolved and and you know the neighbors will, will send me something and say oh you know they showed up today they were out here today and you know the guy's cleaning up his yard or he's moving his cars or what, whatever it is and so um it's just um it's kind of on, a, on an individual basis but um people do want to know what you know they want to know that what they have complained about is being taken care of so I agree 100 percent thank you for sharing that so real quickly, order of business, the three items we discussed, what are the action items we're leaving tonight? What are we doing with these three items, if anything? I've, I've heard we're asking staff to do something on, you know, we talked about the Grand Tree Ordinance, talked about use yeah. separation, we've talked about the code enforcement on penalties and all. What, any action items for staff? Well, my and, request and was to up? look at moving it back to 32 inches. So I think there's going to, I think David mentioned he was going to look at and look at what is what could be the next step to moving forward or back to an older policy that we currently had before. Yep. Okay. <laughs> All right. What about on use separation? We we said that we were looking for some creative suggestions. Are we going to be more specific? And when are we going to when are we going <coughs> to go back and revisit these items? So what are we specifically asking for? And when do we come back to revisit these items? So on the, on the use separation, I would ask that we leave it the way it is. I know a couple people have some proposals they would like to make to council. So if, if we want to, if you want to refer that back to the planning and zoning committee, um, you know we've talked about grand trees there multiple times. But um, if you wanted to refer those back to the planning and zoning committee, we could do that. Um, and just here, if there are a couple people that want to have that have some different ideas for. Um, excuse me. What? What? I was talking to Kelly. Oh. So that was it. And then the I think the item three on here was um, is coming back before council anyway, isn't it? The third I think item. that's if council supports that. I mean, so I guess on the use separation, what what is the will of council on that? Do we is are there proposals that are being made? Well, I think we need yeah. to talk. I think recommendations need to be brought back to us. I yeah, I'd like to keep both of these in workshop, just because we brought it out in a workshop. I think it would be okay. good to keep them all in workshop and keep. That, that way everybody can be participating in the conversation. Um, but I, I, I think as far as separation, I, I think support that. Yeah, I think the the separation though um, on that on the uh, use separation. I think I'm I'm looking for recommendations from staff. 
if they're going to come back with a report or recommendation, we have mm -hmm. to have it in some form of for some format, whether it's mm -hmm. workshop or council. I wasn't talking. I wasn't speaking about a recommendation from planning. I mean, I think Gary wanted to make a presentation. He wanted to present something so he could present that to the um, to the planning and zoning committee. That's what that would be the appropriate who's, place for that. Who's Gary? Gary, the car wash guy. Oh. Just need to scrap the whole thing and go back to what we had before. But if it's working, let it let it stay there. Well, the recommendation was to come back with, based on a request that I had to staff to come back because I would like to bring it back to what it was before, size-wise. So I would like to hear what they have to say and bring it back, and then we can decide as a committee what direction we want to go in. Committee. Or that would be my purpose. Or here. The workshop. Back to a oh. workshop, not a committee, but a workshop. But I think a good point was made about species, you know, they, that some aren't going to grow to 32 inches like a dog would. I mean, I'm not sure. Is there, is there support for that to come? Well, that's what we need to hear from council. What, that's what we need to hear from you all. Is there anything out of this grand tree that you think that we need to ask for, for staff um, follow-up on? You? You know, it's um, it's complicated because I'd have to see the list of species because it says in here some 12 inches or less, depending on the species. It says pines at 32, and it said all other at 24. So I'd, I'd have to dig into that. So it's I mean, I, in committee, is there a willingness? Let, let me let me let me get the pulse of council because we need to move on. Is there a willingness to consider the recommendation that was proposed to re to bring it back to 32 inches? Yes. Well, I don't think we can say it's across there the board is. 32, though. For well, all I'm just species. trying to figure Everybody's been silent here, so if we really want action items, I need to hear from each person individually. Was there anything coming out of the grand, the grand tree that you wanted to ask staff to do anything with? Um, no, I asked my questions, and I'm satisfied with the answers to the questions. My, my, my point at the end was about process, and when things Excellent. come up, with planning and zoning, if it relates to Grand Tree or anything else we've passed, I would hope they would bring it back to us and make us aware of it because we may need to go back and revisit it. Agreed. So there is no. Well, my recommendation would be for staff to come back. I'm recommending we do bring it back to 32 inches, and that would be my request that we bring that back to workshop. Is there, is there another council member that supports that? I, I do. I I'd support 36. Got the. I mean. 32 inches is not that big of a tree. I got to be honest. I mean, I, I can take you to the wood yard and show you. And, and how in the world pine What about an explanation of all species so we understand? Cause you, because, well, because I again. We, I support this staying in workshop. Take a look at that, and let's, let's yeah. report back to us. When it comes to the use separation. Uh, Madam Chair, if I, what am I taking a look at? Um, the 32 inch. The 32 How you inches. would change that and what the, what your. If I could suggest something maybe that, that'll move us off of this. Um, I do think it, there probably is some validity to doing species specific requirements. And if we're gonna just, rather than just say a blanket 32, let us take another look at where we've uh, set those for each species and justify that to council or say there's some flexibility or something rather than just go back to the old ordinance, which I really don't think you want to do because there's a lot of good stuff that is helpful to development community that we've put in there. So if we could just limit what changes we're talking about to the size diameter we're talking about, we can reevaluate that and make some recommendations to you. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know what I'm asking for, but yes. Use separation. I think there was um, some interest in wanting to hear what would you have put in place across the board for other areas of the community um, that would have prevented maybe the the number of location there. Um, what else do, did anything come out of the use separation piece? Is there a way to find a a solution? A solution what? that allows 
a gas station? I mean, I don't know. Is there is there some tweak to this that council wants to consider or ask management to take a look at and come back with? Yeah. I, I mean, I thought this was the reason for the discussion tonight, that we would look at uh, possible options to uh, whether it's the 660 feet or is the um, type of business. So I'd, I would be looking at recommendations or that we may be able to um, adjust or amend this. Well, I know we want to leave, so I might as well go ahead and bring this up too. So I had mentioned when I, when I suggested we bring the 660 and the Grand Tree back to workshop, I also suggested with that that we have um, an opportunity to hear from the people that are affected by the ordinances that we're passing. So I'd like to encourage that we create a standard for workshops if we're covering a topic that affects a demographic from York County that, like we do here, we have 15, first 15 people can sign up and speak for two minutes. Maybe we have five for something and five against um, for two minutes. So at least we get to hear from the people that are affected by it and that will give us a different perspective. So I'd like to see us change our workshop workshop format that if we did have a workshop where we needed input from the York County community, they would have an opportunity to give us input. And hopefully with five people giving a pro and five giving a con, they're not gonna step on each other. It will be five separate comments, hopefully. I'd like to see that added to workshops personally. I think that would be productive. You and I, I mentioned this to you today, right? That's not the process we've used this far. I understand. If council wants to consider that, I think that's appropriate. I think we need to limit it at the front. We're now at two hours, and we still haven't done our executive session. So um, do you feel like that that applies to, for purposes of tonight, the use separation? You asked, what are the action items? What is your position on that? Do you have anything that you want to send back to, to council? Yeah, I mean, for to, instance, for staff? Uh, so... Yeah, look at when I look at Harris Teeter, where Harris Teeter can't be built with a fuel station where it really probably should be, and there couldn't be a car wash there, and there couldn't be a Chick-fil-A there. You couldn't have a drive-through at the deli of Chick-fil-A if you wanted to, and have a restaurant on the property either. So yeah, I think I think there are probably some ways to um, loosen the restrictions without creating the same issue you have on Highway 49 and Cherry Road. So yes, I I would like to see personally as a member of council that is trying to make good decisions for District 6 and for York County, which includes District 2, as you do for District 6, um, I think that we ought to ask staff to look at it creatively, like you said, and come back with some suggestions. Mr. Roddy. Well, since you mentioned Cherry Road again. No, since you mentioned not Cherry Road, the separation, I did. My wife works for Harris Teeter, and I know part of what they're doing with their stores is Harris Teeter's incorporated these fueling stations. So if you built the Harris Teeter, they couldn't even put their gas station. So that, that's permissible? And <coughs> they can't build the Harris well, Teeter without no a gas station. Yes, they can. So like in, in the local auditorium for Harris Teeter, they can put a fuel okay. station there. Okay. I was just thinking some of those type businesses, just like I mentioned earlier, two restaurants that, that I think it's Taco Bell and KFC, you know, just reading that, my question was, could that not be in the same building or on the same property? And obviously, they, if they got two drive throughs they couldn't. But just thinking of different business models that have changed over the years, what companies are doing now versus 20 years ago, if they own two different type franchises, they not be and then the Harris Teeter thing came to mind about the fueling station so as long as those type things can be permitted I don't think we're losing ground anywhere um, I would hate for that separation to prohibit those new ideas that are developing and taking away from people's business model if they own it they should be able to put it on the same property so I think one thing that happened with the Harris Teeter is there is going to be a fueling station on the property, but it's not where they would prefer it to be because it's 660 to another it's business in the restriction so they had to move it further away on the property, which is not where they would like for it to be on the property. So right. they would rather have it on the front part of the property, I believe, if I'm looking at the schematic properly, but they had to move it. So the 660 is complicating their development and limiting what they can do on the on the property 
like a Chick Fil A or a Starbucks. Use that example when you're back to having the three gas stations right in a row and a car wash and well, that, storage units all in that all on a primary intersection. Well, I think that's where we go back to David and Jonathan, and we have them come back with some creative suggestions to tweak the ordinance as it's written. Like if it's the same property owner, and he wants to have the, the Harris Teeter and the Feudal Station, he shouldn't have to meet that separation because it's one piece of property. Are you no, suggesting that the there's no, a piece of property across November the street that limits them workshop be a public hearing? I just need to know that in time to let people know so y'all can hear time. I think. Are we gonna Are we gonna make a workshop a public hearing? Every workshop would be a public hearing, wouldn't it? I think what council needs to do is they need to sit on what they've heard tonight, okay. and they need to decide if there's some specific thing that they want referred. Uh, I don't know that we're going to get to that answer tonight. I mean, I, I think you've had some questions from folks that have reached out. I don't have a problem with us having a workshop where folks can participate as long as council is in favor of that and wants to participate. Um, I do think that that's, that's a conversation that we can have after this, but if there's no specific direction from tonight as to what it is that we want staff to do, that makes it hard. Well, that Sitting was my point. Here. I didn't want us to leave workshop tonight not knowing what we were doing. What are the next steps on these three items? What's your proposal? I would propose that staff go back and look at the 660 and massage it, and uh, if anybody's got any input or suggestion to staff, make it to staff between now and the next workshop or whenever we're going to discuss it, and then maybe we'll have something that makes sense. I don't know. But we've, we've all said individually that we feel like the 660 is restrictive and we wouldn't have it in our own district. So we don't want to, I mean, I don't know what each individual person wants to do, but that, they did say that. So if there's, if there's the will of the group to massage it and to come up with something that would allow um, a gas station to have a car wash instead of putting the car wash with another, another curb cut 661 feet down the street, that makes sense. Yeah, or a storage I'd, facility I'd or whatever. Yeah. All right. Okay. All right. Any other discussion on that? Do you need clarification? I'm not sure you're going to get it. But, you, you, you know, because ultimately, <laughs> the way I see this is, and I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, and I know we need to leave, but look at the areas that are going, going to develop in York County at some point in time. What we're trying to do is put some language in, what I would like to see is put some language in place that is satisfactory for, for this area in District 2, but is satisfactory in your area if that area develops 10, 15, 20 years from now in any other area of the county. But this is a small area plan. This is not something that's applicable across county-wide. But it's the limitation of the plan, of yeah. the restrictions <coughs> is the concern. Are you, are you asking that you propose something that could be county-wide? Yeah. No, no, that's not. That's definitely not. What's well, I, I asked. I asked you to take a look at what would you have proposed to prevent what occurred there. I'm hearing other councils say they want you to take a look at. Is there a way to solve the issues from that? What some of the community residents have come out with still have the use restrictions, but allow the development to be more clustered. If I if I could answer this, Jonathan, I, mean, I, I think. As Jonathan pointed out earlier, the stated goal of the small area plan, which is the comprehensive plan, is to limit those uses in that district. If that is the goal of council, still remains a goal, and that's the stated goal, then that's what this ordinance does. If you're asking us to look at if there are changes we can make that still limit those uses, we can reevaluate that. I don't know how much that's going to change the ordinance. If that is no longer the antenna council to limit those uses, then we need to make adjustments to the small area plan and to the ordinance. But I don't, so I don't, we don't have, to answer your question, we don't have clear direction from what council wants us to recommend based on. So if the, if the basis is you still want to limit those uses, then we, we can look to see if there's another way to do that. But if, if your goal is to uh, allow those uses throughout, we need to make changes accordingly. I've heard the majority of council say they're comfortable with limiting uses in, in this area, and let's just keep it to this area. Is there something else that's, but I've also heard, is there a way to meet the concerns that some of the communities come out and said about 
can you put can you restrict the gas station but only have one that's that's here that makes more sense to be on a corner versus right next to a neighborhood mm -hmm. y'all have heard the same concerns we've heard yeah. is there something that you want to propose is there something that you can put together sure I, I think um, I've talked about some of the potential um, modifications uh, earlier this evening but <clears throat> as I think I understand uh, the request is to maintain um, the discouragement of the concentration of the uses but propose some revisions that perhaps uh, reduce the burden of that restriction to some degree do I have that let right? me hear that from council I mean let me hear it from y'all because I don't want yeah. to do yeah I think it, uh, looking at it from that perspective yeah I want we'd like to hear back your opinion how we can reduce down the burden I on do. this I do yeah too. yeah I'm, I'm not opposed of hearing options um, but that doesn't mean that just because staff brings us an option that has to be the option we can say okay well we heard you we think that's nice but we'll just leave it like it is or yeah that's a really good idea or we think that's something that can work so never opposed to hearing options but let's don't get it in our minds that whatever they bring back is definitely going to be the next plan to scrap what what's already there. So there's nothing wrong with letting the staff do their due diligence to see what mm -hmm. what they can come up with. And obviously, if the council member of that district says, "Yeah, this is something that I give my blessing to," I think that that that's probably the route that it should go. Well, my my problem is I just hope that we ain't taking people bought purchased or whatever and they own that land just like this person over here is and are we taking away from their right of ownership of that property let's let's on the final one does council want to see that back on the agenda what say you? Let's go down the line. The last one we spoke of, I, I don't, yeah, I don't have an issue with the last one. Tommy, well, that's four. All right. I, I'm sorry, um, just a clarification. That ordinance has had first reading. Right. So in order for it not to go forward, we would need to have it on the agenda and have it voted down, correct? We're just saying, I think we moved it. I think we deferred. At one point, I thought we deferred an action you, you on it. De you deferred it to the next meeting after this work. Okay, so it's on there anyway. All right, good deal. Yeah, just want to be clear that it's coming back. You can vote right. it down there. Yep, that's what we understand. Executive session, do we have a motion? Yeah, motion to receive legal advice, contractual matter, former franchise territory. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, we'll move straight into executive session. No action was taken. Do we have a motion? Yeah, a motion to direct staff to draft an, an ordinance proposing change to the county sewer ordinance addressing maintenance on gravity sewer lines within specific need in, form franchi in former franchise territory as addressed in executive session. Motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Hearing none, motion carries. Do we have a motion to adjourn? Second. Motion and second. All in favor say aye. 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 We are adjourned.